Hey everyone. I see that there are, there are 600 people and counting joining us. Um, so thanks so much for, for saying hi and showing up. Um, welcome to the second Out of Union Walk Roundtable. We had one last week. This is our second one. We'll have another one next week. Um, as I said before, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we're going to prioritize questions about India's water issues uh, and, and, and environmental issues. That's what we're talking about today. Um, my name is Camila Bromley. I'm the social media manager for the Out of Eden Walk. I'm, I'm going to be moderating today. Um, and just a quick intro on why we're doing this panel. Um, uh, the team, the, the Out of Eden Walk India team, which comprises many of the, the people you see here today, um, crossed 24,000 miles and 4,000 kilometers over 17 months. That was in 2018 and 2019. And um, a National Geographic magazine story um, about that journey has just been published. Um, the story is about India's water crisis. It was authored by Paul Salapek. Um, it was shot, photographs were shot by John Stanmeyer to accompany the story. Um, and the other panelists here also contributed reporting to the story and walks on the trail um, along with Paul. Um, so today we're gonna talk about, um, talk about the enormous uh, water crisis in India. Um, just to put it in perspective very quickly, about 200,000 people a year in India die from lack of access to clean water. Um, for a US audience, that's, that's well over the number of Americans who have died so far from COVID-19. Um, it's a very urgent, colossal um, water crisis facing the subcontinent. Um, so today we're gonna hear from, from Paul, from John, from the other, uh, from writers and experts, um, on India's river systems and water ecology. So I'm just gonna introduce everyone very quickly. Um, our speakers are first, Arti Kumar Rao. She's a National Geographic explorer, photographer, reporter, a biologist, and an ecologist. Arti walked across the Punjab and parts of Manipur. Um, we also have Siddharth Agarwal. He documented India's riverways on foot for years before he joined the Adivina Walk. Um, he runs Veditum, a storytelling foundation. We'll share the link in, the, in our chat. Um, Prem Panikar is a veteran journalist and an educator. He walked through parts of Rajasthan. Priyanka Borpujari is a human rights journalist who walked through Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal, and Assam. John Stanmeyer is a National Geographic photographer who shot the stunning images for this magazine story. Um, Camilla Ferrari is a multimedia visual artist based in Milan, um, very kindly streaming to us from the airport. Um, and uh, finally, Paul Salopek is the founder of the Out of Unawab project. So I'm going to start the discussion with Paul. Um, I want to ask him, you know, there are many, many, an infinite number of subjects to write about when you spend 17 months in India. So why were you interested in writing about water issues? Yeah, no, welcome everybody uh, uh, in India, in North America and across the world. I saw um, viewers from all over the place, including uh, uh, Mi Tierra de Mi Niñez in Mexico, bienvenidos. Um, you know, when, when you think about India, you say the word India to most of the international community, it evokes certain kind of archetypal landscapes, certain kind of stereotype landscapes. And to be honest, a lot of my Indian friends have this in their heads too. And that is a kind of a, a water world, right? It's got these big muscular rivers, the Indus, the, the Ganga or, or Ganges, the Brahmaputra, kind of, you know, elbowing their way through these vast plains uh, of the subcontinent, feeding big, you know, green agricultural uh, landscapes of, of wheat or millet or rice. Um, India has perhaps the rainiest corner of the world up in Meghalaya, up in the Northeast, where they get 38 feet or more than 10 meters of rain. I mean, that's a three-story building high of rain. Um, and even in the West, in, in, in places like the Tar Desert of Rajasthan, it's, it's, it's pocked with, with hand-dug wells, where if you look down in them, 
uh, you could be surrounded by yellow sand deserts, but you look down into these wells and you see rainwater, a disk of, of silver reflecting the sky. So India has this reputation, has this image of kind of just being a, a lush place mostly. Um, you know, but it's not true. And you certainly begin to see that, that it's not true when you, when you traverse this vast northern part of the country on foot. So over the course of uh, 2018 and 2019, all of us on this uh, uh, round table walked through parts of India together, uh, 2,400 miles, 4,000 kilometers, and you quickly learn that in the hundreds of conversations that we have, mostly with the rural Indians, right? Because we're, working, we're walking mostly through rural landscapes. The people, the, the men and women who grow the food for six of the world's population, um, water bubbles up as a major concern and, and a serious anxiety. It's not just kind of a minor one, it's a serious one. Uh, either there's not enough of it or there's too much of it or it's, it's, its appearance and disappearance in the natural system is getting more and more erratic due to climate change or the existing supplies and, and rivers are growing more limited with greater use. Um, and the statistics that you, that you start bumping into as you do some homework on the water crisis in India quickly reveals probably the worst water crisis in the world. Um, 100 million urban Indians uh, living in cities who are probably going to suck dry their aquifers this year. Um, up to 75% of Indian households don't have access to, to clean drinking water. Uh, it, up to 600 million Indians um, are affected by either a shortage of clean water or uh, just the, the source is polluted or there's just not enough of it. So a scale of a problem that's almost unimaginable. It's just so big. Uh, it's so complicated. And, and the authorities are proposing massive, when they're focused on it, producing massive uh, plans like river linking, right? Moving entire rivers around, these very drastic um, kind of terraforming plans that you would do on another planet. So um, we're very uh, lucky tonight to have some of the, the finest thinkers and artists, uh, not just in India, but in the world, an international panel of, 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 of creative people who are going to share with us their perspective and their perceptions on the storytelling around this water crisis, this kind of historic um, problem that, that the world is facing in India. And I'll leave it there. I'm so excited. I'm going to learn a lot tonight from my friends. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, so we're going to, so next I want to hear from RT. So RT is going to show a couple of videos and, and photos um, and talk about um, endangered species that she saw um, while walking through the Punjab and other parts of India. Um, go ahead, RT. Oh, RT, you're on mute. <laughs> Better? Sorry. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> and you can see my screen, Camille? Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, about a week into the walk, after I picked up uh, Paul from the border with Pakistan, we reached a wetland in Punjab called Harike. And uh, Paul was closeted in his room, writing, thinking, doing his thing. And I decided to step out and look for Indus dolphins. I had no idea that they were there until about a week before that, when I was just doing some research about our route. And um, so I decided to go looking for dolphins. I didn't know where to begin. So I just hailed a cab, told them to take me to the edge of the river. And there I met a boatman and I asked him, have you seen the bhulan? Bhulan is the uh, local name for a dolphin. It, it means long-lipped one because the Indus dolphin has a long snout. And he said, whatever I, I expected, I didn't expect his answer. He said, yeah, just two went just upstream about 10 minutes ago. And I was like, what? I can't believe this because these guys are really endangered. They're endangered in the world. And in India, there are under a dozen, maybe between five and 11. That's it. And um, he'd seen two of them. And so I jumped on his boat and we went um, and we started sailing down while he was ferrying people across. 
and I had my eyes peeled out and within 10 minutes of getting on his boat, this happened. These are Indus dolphins, Platanista gangetica minor. They are a subspecies of the gangetic dolphin, which is India's national aquatic animal. And they are extremely endangered. There are, I think, maybe 2,000 in the whole world, most of them in Pakistan, and about 5 to 11 in India. And the biggest threats they face are, um, are dams because their uh, habitat has been uh, fragmented. You know, there are just dam after dam after dam on the river stems and their population, which you know, traditionally migrates up and down has been fragmented. And therefore there are just a few left you know, in different places. Most of them in Pakistan, a few in India. And just to give you a sense of where this is, I wanted to call your attention to the place we were in. This is the wetland as seen from the sky just before I was landing in Amritsar. Uh, pay attention to this color of that river, Sutlej. There, it's the confluence of two rivers in the Indus Basin, the Sutlej and the Bias. And you see the color difference. There's one dark and one fairly clean. And from the ground, this is exactly how it looks. The Sutlej flows black and putrid, and the Bias is much cleaner. And so it has a reprieve that way, but it is bookended with dams. And so, again, you know, you have these dolphins, which are just right there in that much, um, in just a small stem of the river, but also beholden to water flows because the dam upstream diverts a lot of water. And um, even when I was there, the water fluctuated by two feet up and down. And when the water falls low, the dolphins don't like it. They like deep waters. And then they congregate towards places where there is deeper water, where the fish are, but that's where they also meet fishermen. And so, you know, there are instances of, uh, of conflict as well. When, when Paul and I were um, on the riverside, we heard these fishermen across the river and it didn't sound like Punjabi. And people were wondering, you know, who are these fishermen? And we floated to them. And we re when we reached them, we realized that these guys were migrants. They had come across the breadth of India a thousand miles from Bengal to the Bias to fish. Bengal, Bengal is full of rivers. And so I asked them, where in Bengal are you from? And they're from the Ganga, just on the, on the shores of the Ganga, on the banks of the Ganga. And I asked them, why? Why would fishermen from the Ganga come all the way to Bias to fish? And then they told me where they lived. They lived in a place which is in the district Murshidabad, and I realized why they would be here. I have been to this place, I've worked here, and it is a devastated, ravished, ravaged landscape, um, completely shorn of any means of livelihood. We're now in Bengal, we've moved to, from Punjab to Bengal. It's a place where children are put into um, child labor. They, there is rampant child marriage, uh, infant mortality, uh, maternal mortality is sky high, and um, every possible um, means of hardship in this land. People say they go to bed as landlords and wake up as beggars. Why? Because their homes are swallowed up by the river. Now, why? Why does this happen? About 50 years ago, in 1971, India built a dam on, just upstream of Murshidabad at a place called Faraka. And some of you have heard me speak about this, but I did not expect to meet it on the walk in Punjab. Uh, what Faraka did was, it was built to ostensibly flush out the silt in the Calcutta port, but what it ended up doing was something completely different. It did not work. The, the silt did not get flushed out. But it, what it did do was it devastated the landscape. All the yellow part that you see is about 1,200 kilometers, about um, um, almost 800 uh, miles of, uh, of river that it just completely devastated in different ways. That's the part that has been affected by the, um, 
And now I just want to, uh, here's what happened. The, the river started swinging wildly. And it, when it started, because it was interrupted, uh, the Ganga is the siltiest river on earth. And when you dam such a river, the silt builds up. When the silt builds up, the riverbed rises. When the riverbed rises, the river wanders. It wanders and it swallows up land wherever it can find it. And this is what started happening. Uh, if you pay attention to the, to, to the years at the bottom, you'll see from 1984 till about 2018, how the rivers moved. And this is upstream of it. And you can see it again um, as, it, uh, as it cycles through. I hope people can see this. I know last time the, the video was a little choppy. But you'll see how wildly the river has been moving. And that's why this is what happens. There are cracks that, are build, that build up on the banks of the river. And, um, and it's just swallowed by it. And people lose farms. People lose um, homes, uh, hospitals, schools. Everything is taken um, by this and all because of that dam and the way it was built. People are then forced to migrate and we met some migrants over there but the rest flood to places like uh, Bombay and Calcutta. So another thing happened and that's why we saw fishermen here. There, there is an anadromous fish, a shad, an Indian shad that goes from the Bay of Bengal all the way, it used to go all the way up to Agra and Delhi uh, to spawn and, um, and then come back to live its uh, life out in, in the Bay of Bengal. But when the dam was built, its migratory pattern was uh, disrupted and it couldn't go up a river anymore to spawn and the whole fishery collapsed. And what has ended up happening is that fishermen along the Ganges, which was once a thriving, which had a high, thriving fishery, are now forced into debt. And these hills are fishermen who, and people who used, to, who used to depend upon this for their living. They could fish just three months in the year and make it for the rest of the year. And now they have to do all kinds of things like finding daily wage work and, um, and uh, are left to market forces. What has happened along our rivers all through, you know, once upon a time, we used to have a metaphor for clamor as the fish market, right? But all along India's rivers, fish markets are now silent. We do not have river fish anymore. We actually find fish trucked from aquaculture ponds across the country on beds of ice to the Ganga, to the Brahmaputra. And the, and the fishermen just don't make any money at all. And so you see the dam that was built at Faraka, it has upstream and downstream um, problems. Now, this was done for uh, 50 years ago, and you'd think that we'd learned our lesson, but let's pull back and look at what is happening here. These uh, little black things that you see are dams that are built on the Ganga, and all those little brown things that you see are those that are planned on the Brahmaputra. Not all built, thank goodness. But we haven't stopped. We're still building dams, and these dams are devastating because they control water flows. And as we talked about before, when the dolphin, which love deep waters, go towards deep waters for fish, they encounter fishing nets where fishermen have also come. And unintended deaths. You know, you have dolphins with their fine teeth getting caught up in the net, and then you know we're, we're losing. Um, uh, you know, our national animal, which is an endangered creature. Not only that, what the dam also does it, is it holds back silt and diverts water. When it holds back silt, the silt is needed to build the delta and to shore itself up against rising sea levels. And when you stop that from happening, the delta, which, which is a delicate balance between sweet and brine, starts going out of whack. And what we're finding now is that we are suffering from increased salinity and saltwater intrusion. So that dam upstream has affected the lives of millions of people in the, in the Ganga Basin. Not only that, the hits just keep on coming. We have now uh, national waterways planned, which means that we're going to be seeing shipping traffic go all along this, um, the Ganga and the Brahmaputra basins. And that covers almost 90% of the the range of the dolphin. So you can imagine. Um, China, having built these dams and, uh, and done all kinds of things to its water, to its rivers, has already seen the extinction of its river dolphin, the Baiji. And India might well be going the same way. And those waterways come with an added uh, disadvantage. There are mishaps. The oil spill in the Sundarbans, which is the largest unbroken stand of mangroves in the world and home to the famous um, Royal Bengal tiger, is a huge, massively trafficked shipping route, including uh, ships that carry coal, coal ash, fly ash, and even oil. And then in 2014, the inevitable happened, and we did have a massive oil spill, which was then left to be cleaned up by, um, 
by the just by the uh, fishermen that live there. The governments just wash their hands off it. This shipping route has since gained in traffic because we're building thermal power plants just close to um, the, um, the Sundarbans. And um, that's what it looks like. And every day, and almost every month, this year in 2020, almost every month there's been a mishap. And Sid just sent me news that today there has been yet another uh, capsizing of a ferry with coal ash. And coal ash is, is toxic. It's not good for the delicate ecosystems over here. Um, so why should we care, right? All of this is happening somewhere far away in the rivers. But this is India's demographic dividend. This is who is going to be India's future. And they, all along India's rivers, this is the largest and most populated river basin in the world. 800 million people. Are, and then there are these kids who are growing up without schools, no access to healthcare, no access to education. And dreams are just left by the wayside. And this is what you get. You get migrants sitting around uh, without much to do. It's like uh, John Muir said, right? When you target something, you, you find a whole universe hitched to it something like that. But one thoughtless engineering um, solution to a problem has, has affected life across the board and not, just, um, and not just in one place. It goes up, down. And uh, so, so I wanted to just leave you guys with one thought that often it's not the river that devastates. We keep talking about, oh, the river devastated it and we have floods and things like that. But we need to think a little bit further and see what it is that led to that because it's probably what we did to the river that does the devastation. Thank you. I want to just add one thing. I want to thank National Geographic Society for a grant which is allowing me to deepen and broaden this work. So thank you, guys. I'm going to stop screen share. We're back. Thank you, RT. Um, there are tons of good questions coming into the Q&A, so add them there. Looks like there's an upvoting feature too, so you can, if, if you see another question that interests you, you can like it. Um, next, we're gonna go to Sid. Um, Sid, can you talk about the importance of groundwater in India and the effects of dams on the river ecosystems? Right. Uh, thanks, RT, for that uh, terrible question and stories and uh, um, I'm just uh, going to take half a minute here to talk about something really important. Uh, the rivers that we talked about, the Ganga, the Brahmaputra, uh, they are massively flooding right now uh, in Assam, in Bihar, and there's hardly any attention to these issues. Um, I'm, I want to take this opportunity now that I have to talk to all of you and say that at least go look up that there are these massive floods with literally hundreds of millions of people affected with no national media attention in India. And uh, yeah, with that, I'll come back to what I want to talk about. And it just carries on from what Arti just said in her last slide that often it's not what, it, often it's what we do to the rivers that uh, really uh, give us these effects. Uh, and same the condition with the floods that we're currently facing in Assam and uh, Bihar, uh, especially in India. And that's the introduction of these embankments that are trying to tie down our rivers. And uh, these dams, which are not operated properly and they let water flow uh, untimely and don't follow proper procedures. And both of these things point at something that is really important, is that rivers as a concept have completely vanished from uh, our minds and they've just been channeled in our minds as well uh, as a channel of water, which it exactly is not. What it is, is an ecosystem. And I just want to talk about something technical, but I'll try and uh, simplify it. That uh, a river, of course, is everything in its catchment, all the water that falls in a certain area and comes to a, a river, that's, that area is called the river basin or watershed. Uh, for a river, for a river's health, there are three things that are really important. The first is, uh, something called lateral connectivity, then there is longitudinal connectivity, and then there is vertical connectivity. Uh, all three are important for the river to survive. And uh, when you put dams on the river, we 
block the longitudinal connectivity along the length of the flow of the river we block the river we kill it like that when we make embankments and don't let the river meander we block the river and do not let it spread where it's supposed to spread when we do both of these what we also do is we stop the river's lateral connectivity which is with the ground and i'm going to come to the idea of ground and ground water in a bit continuing from what arti just said about waterways uh, i was walking along the ganga in uh, 2016 and 17 the river and i met a lot of people and i wanted to talk to them about uh, these ideas of waterways and if you think about a waterway the idea of a waterway is to run a ship or a barge on it and how do you run a ship or a barge in a river which does not have water and then come all these ideas about uh, uh, bridging the river and uh, making channels in the river uh so the question then is that why is there no flow in the river so as an example on the ganga if you look at this map that was prepared as a for a citizens report in india uh, all the red dots that you can see are dams on the tributary of the ganga and those actually make the river the river is not just that one single stream of water it's all of this combined that makes the river and all those red dots that you see are dams on the river that stop that flow and uh the a uh, walk that i did along the river ganga was called moving upstream as part of my organization called vedatam uh which i uh, uh will mention again uh but during this walk i met uh riparian communities communities that live alongside the river and back then in 2016 the idea was uh, the ganga is the first waterway that they want to uh, make operational and back then they had a plan of building 15 barrages on the river Uh, one at every hundred kilometers between Allahabad in uh, central India to West Bengal. On the map, you can see the two red dots. Between that, they wanted to make fifteen barrages. Uh, thankfully, that uh, idea has since been scrapped. Uh, but all the effects that Arti spoke about still exist. Uh, the impact still exists, and this is something that needs more attention and more talking. Um, from this, I'll take you to another river called the Ken, which is another river that I walk. and also a river that paul and i when walking through central india visited uh, there's a story on this that i think we can put the link for in the uh, chat box and this river uh is part of the attention because of this map what you see in this map is uh, nothing short of madness there's this plan to take waters from one river which is supposedly uh surplus to another river which is supposedly deficit and the kind of propositions here or of the extent of changing the course of a river flowing from north to east to north to west literally changing the course of where the water goes to the sea and that is varying on a lot of accounts uh, and i'll just share uh, this particular example uh, this is the river ken that is proposed to be channeled away from its uh, uh be uh first chained behind a dam and then taken away to another river called river betwa which is again something that we cross um and at what is that risk is the panna tiger reserve here uh if the dam is built we lose about 6000 hectares of land of which about 5000 hectares of land is prime forest about 23 million trees are going to get submerged behind this uh i thought 23 lakh trees which is 2.3 million trees which will get submerged behind this and that's something that should worry us but somehow it's not worrying the people who are proposing these plans without looking at alternatives and uh, th this is something that i documented as part of my uh, journey along river ken again under the moving upstream project uh, so we talked about, uh, we documented the river ken we met people and since it is also connected to the river betwa uh, as part of a collaboration between the out of eden walk we put together a fellowship and asked young indians to walk along rivers in india and document them and they documented uh, that river uh but coming back to the ken uh while walking along the ken this river we uh noticed some interesting aspects that this is a river that has excess water supposedly and in the image here is a hand pump 
that when I try to pump out, uh, you can see the time on the right side of the screen. That's one minute, 50 seconds. That's how much time it took for me to pump out one liter of water from this area and uh, from this hand pump. So you can imagine uh, how much effort people are having to put. And also that this impact uh, of drawing groundwater and the effort falls disproportionately on uh, the female gender and which is something that's not talked about often i think that's important to talk about but why am i talking about this is because this water is coming from the ground and uh, we often don't talk about the connection between what's under the ground and the rivers that we see that are stop, uh, that have stopped flowing so i'll quickly take you to uh, the river bed of the ken which we found dry largely and uh, this short video of a spring in the riverbed of River Ken, you can see water oozing out of the ground. And this spring, uh, what you're looking at is probably two feet wide. Uh, but very soon, that two feet wide pool becomes a 15, 20 feet wide pool. This is, this is all lean season uh, when the groundwater is starting to fill the river. This small pool then becomes a larger pool when, when it connects to more pools that have been created because of groundwater. And those pools then form a river. This is how uh, rivers that are not fed by glaciers actually form. And if you take away the groundwater from this equation, then you can see that there is no river. Because what will feed the river otherwise? And that brings me to the last second part of my uh, uh, presentation, which is uh, groundwater. And that's the number of wells that we have in India, if you can look at the number. 40 million wells, open wells and bore wells. And uh, that is the amount of water that India as a country extracts. That is more than China and America combined, which are on places two and three uh, in the groundwater extraction table. Um, what's also more worrying is that this whole process of extracting groundwater started in 1980s. But we as a country didn't really realize this until 2005. So it was already 25 years late for us to take action that our groundwater is depleting at such a fast level. Not just extraction, this water is actually going out of India. This water is going out embedded in crops that we export. High water uh, requirement crops that uh, go out of India are exported and that puts the nation uh, at large at a deficit. And this is something that needs to change. Currently, a lot of this is purely driven by policy. And uh, a change in policy, along with change in mindset of people, is something that can address this. Uh, this has put us at risk in India. Uh, the per capita water availability in India from 1961 to now, in 60, uh, 50, 60 years, has gone from, you can see the numbers on the screen, from 4,100 uh, meters cube per person per year to just 1,500 meters a meter cube per capita per year. And the safe level is around 1,700. So we've already dropped under that. And I just wanted to use these numbers to tell you about the scale of the problem we're looking at. And when we look at all of this, uh, we keep thinking about water that is still available, the 1,500 that's still available as something that's uh, equally available, it's not. Uh, something that is available is clean, it is not. And that is what I want to talk about next. Uh, and this is probably just uh, another minute of uh, my time. That in India, about 80%, 85% of rural water supply in the villages is from groundwater. And 50% of that is contaminated. I just mentioned some quick numbers on the screen of uh, how many people are at risk because of this contaminated water. A lot of this is geogenic contamination because we extracted so much water from the ground that uh, the water that we are now extracting is almost fossil water. It's hundreds of years old, thousands of years old even in some places. And that water, because of its presence with those rock structures for so long, have now minerals in them. And people, uh, for example, in the US, the companies are putting uh, uh, fluoride in the uh, toothpaste because there's not enough fluoride. In India, we're aping that. We are uh, putting fluoride in our toothpaste 
but uh, we already have too much fluoride in our water in a lot of places. So um, it's just this uh, weird lens through which we are looking at our country. And I think that needs to change. It needs to become more from the ground that we look at the country. Um, just a small example of uh, citizen science. Uh, while walking with Paul in Rajasthan, I was testing for fluoride in groundwater using this portable test, te uh, test kit uh, produced by this organization called Foundation for Environmental Monitoring. Uh, there's lots of organizations working towards uh, water quality issues in India. Uh, a lot of them have been successful, but then it's uh, this huge policy, policy push that's required. There's this uh, uh, citizen science that's required. So I think that uh, bridge is not really forming. And I think it's also because uh, we are completely disconnected from this space at the moment. And uh, what we are left with is, uh, of course, there are good people who want to make water accessible to others. So just an example of how in one of the villages in Rajasthan that we visited, uh, there's high fluoride in the uh, water. So a uh, local religious trust has uh, been providing uh, water to locals uh, in uh, these plastic tankers, uh, plastic uh, uh, canisters. But this only serves about 20% of the village. Uh, the rest of them still don't have access to clean water. And the RO plant where this happens, where they clean the water and they chill the water, actually puts back uh, excess fluoride contaminated water back into the ground, which really hurts uh, the village again. So uh, we're trying to do these small uh, uh, patchwork across the nation. But as a policy, I think we're still lacking. And that's something that needs to be looked at. Um, and Every time we talk about this question of where's the flow, um, if we don't look at the layer, uh, the uh, surface under, underneath us, uh, if we don't take care of that, uh, if we don't take care of uh, this uh, disconnectivity that we're bringing to our rivers uh, through dams, through unrequired embankments because of bureaucracy, um, I think we we'll keep asking the question of where's the flow. So yeah, I'll just stop with that. And uh, yeah. Um, thank you, Sid. The, your maps, which I think you create yourself because you're a cartographer are extremely informative. Um, next, we're gonna go to a visual presentation um, from John Stanmeyer and Camilla Ferrari. Um, some of them will be photos from the National Geographic magazine story, but um, John and Camila both have a huge archive of, of photos and videos from their uh, trips to India. So um, John and Camila, I'll let you um, introduce that. Thank you, Camille. Uh, I hope you can hear me fine and hi to all of you. And thank you for having me here for the second panel. So um, we will follow Sid's and Narati's presentation with uh, a slideshow that me and John created together collaboratively. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, we have the we had the amazing opportunity to follow Paul's journey uh, through Northern India. Uh, so what you will see is a combination of John's photographs and my videos uh, that sort of retrace uh, his path and um, talk about the life around rivers, the water issues that we encountered, both from a journalistic perspective and a, an evocative and let's say lyric perspective. So John, I don't know if you wanna add anything, otherwise I'm gonna screen share. <laughs> no, I, I really, Sid, I just wanna say, both Sid and Arati, thank you for incredible presentations. I was excited to see both of them. And, uh, and it really is, is sort of a, maybe just sort of a, a compliment to the incredible background that both of you shared um, while being so long with Paul, really you know, boots on the ground. Camila and I, we moved by car, although we did walk uh, with Paul quite a bit, but uh, your insight, because uh, I've been to India so many times and, and dealt on water issues there and elsewhere, really profound. So, so thank you so much. And uh, yeah, as Camila said, this is the, our pathway following uh, Paul's walk and where, where you, Arati, and, and Sid, and Prem, uh, and Priyanka also um, traveled. Sorry, my Elfrida here is wanting to demand the screen. Um, so I will let this go here because she's going to want to control it.
be sure to have your volume up. There's some beautiful audio here as well.
thank you for watching. Thank you, Camila, for driving that from the airport in Milan. Thank you all. Sorry for the little noises here and there, but that's, you know, <laughs> things that happen, I guess. <laughs> Um, thank you both. That was beautiful. There were so many images and videos that I hadn't seen before. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, we're going to share the link to the National Geographic magazine article here um, in the in the chat box. And there's tons of other links and resources from the audience too that are being shared. So um, make sure to check that out. Um, okay. So next, I want to ask um, Prem Panikar a long time reporter, journalist, and teacher in India. Um, so Prem, we're, we've been hearing from environmentalists about uh, the various urgent issues relating to India's rivers and its water crisis. Um, as a reporter, how do you view the issue? Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, thanks to everybody who uh, joined the uh, web stream and uh, Camille to your question. You know, Siddhanathi is such a uh, dedicated, passionate advocates of rivers. I was listening to them speak and something that Aarti said right at the end about what we do to the rivers reminded me of this commencement ad address that uh, David Foster Wallace once made. Um, in all my memory is kind of misplaced the venue, but I remember he started with the story of two little fish. Uh, so these fish, uh, they were swimming along one day and uh, an elder fish came in the opposite direction, uh, saw the boys and said, how are you doing boys? How's the water treating you? You know, like we talk about the weather. Uh, the two young fish made some polite noises, swam on for a bit, and then one of them turns to the other and says, dude, what is this water thing that old guy was talking about? Uh, Wallace was making the point that the most ubiquitous, the most important realities of life are the ones that are the hardest to see, uh, to understand, to talk about. And at the top of that list, I think, is you know the air we breathe, which we pollute in a million different ways every day, the water that sustains us, the rivers that carry them, the hundreds of millions of people who directly depend on this resource for their uh, survival. It occurred to me while, while listening to Sid and to Arti that uh, we are in a state of both institutional and societal denial. And while we've been talking about India, this is not just an India issue, it's a global one. If you think of, say, a Bolsonaro with uh, uh, Brazil with the Amazon rainforest, or you think of the US with uh, both water sources drying up and rising sea waters threatening some of the cities, denial is everywhere. Uh, the media, with, with very few exceptions, not, have neither the space nor the resources, nor the inclination to train a relentless len lens on these, uh, these existential issues. Uh, what the hell is water, right? And a direct consequence of this is that society, that is you and me and all of us, we remain largely oblivious to the problem. Again, what the hell is water? Turn on the tap and out it comes. And as a consequence of that, again, governments, and again, it is plural, it's not singular, it is not limited to the current dispensation in India, it is governments across time. They're very happy to avoid confronting these issues. They're happy to kick the can down the road, uh, leave it to the next government, or maybe even the next generation to grapple with these issues. And at the same time, these same governments are happy to ignore every environmental norm, every warning, every prompt of common sense, of conscience, and to continue strip mining our collective resources in the name of leading us to, I don't know, some kind of pie in the sky promised land of peace and prosperity and plenty for all. Uh, Greta Thunberg made this point at her UN summit speech um, sometime last year, I think it was in September, and that's what I was thinking of when I was listening to Aarti and Sid. And this is one other thing. We have been kicking the scan down the road for decades. And it occurs to me that we're now running out of road. And that's the thought I want to leave you with. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Prem. Um, okay, question for Priyanka, and then we'll go to the audience Q&A. Um, Priyanka, as a reporter, you cover human rights. 
Um, how has water in India bec also become an issue of human rights? Right. Uh, thanks for having me along with this wonderful panel. It's just, uh, I really don't know what more to add than what everyone has already spoken, Arti and Siddharth, with their expertise and experience. But I think uh, from my years of voting uh, from across India, I, I clearly saw this obvious uh, linkage with water and hygiene and sanitation. And as a woman reporter, whenever I'd be going into spaces, uh, meeting women, the obvious question is menstruation and water and hygiene. And so water was no more just issue that was only about, you know, um, it, it, it suddenly became an issue that was not only about human rights, but also about women's rights. And uh, like I'd spoken last, uh, last week, uh, Paul and I would be calculating our distances by talking to people, asking them about how far places are. And the people we would ask would be women, because women would be the one who are walking miles to collect firewood or even to like, you know, collect water from a well that's far away. Um, as a journalist, I also reported the aftermath of floods. And it was interesting, for example, when we stopped by at the Bhaba in Sukhani in Bihar to see a local newspaper and how it had reported about waterborne diseases. It was very different at local reporting than in national newspapers. So I found that very intriguing. And um, <clears throat> I think there was a huge move in the past year by the Indian government about, you know, erecting more toilets. Yes, there were these concrete toilets erected, but where was the water? Where were the sanitation facilities? So directed, so it came back to this whole question of right to life and human rights, and was again very connected. And, you know, when you're walking across, when you're walking along rivers, and one might just say that rivers are the edges of land, right? But the rivers, what we saw were also edges of communities, as it was evident in the chars of Assam, you know, these shifting islands. And it was interesting that people living on these edges of lands were also living on the edges of India's citizenship because their citizenship, were, were, uh, their citizenship was being threatened and they were anyways living in the ecological margins of India. And I think Siddharth has brilliantly spoken about groundwater issues and it was, it was really crazy to come across families who had said that just one generation ago they would find water 50 feet deep and just the next generation was, uh, you know, uh, drilling up, up to 700 feet to, you know, look up for water. And that is linked to farmlands and food and whose water is it, right? And whose land is it? Uh, we saw, and, and I think, and I think uh, because Out of Eden Walk is a story of migration, uh, water, uh, you know, water issues, dams and floods have caused huge amounts of my, uh, you know, large, uh, wide, large scale migration in India. And uh, India literally has the largest uh, number of internally displaced people because of large dams. And these dams are also being constructed without the explicit consent of the, pe uh, of the people whose lands are being submerged by these dams. So I think it also comes down to, you know, it can seem like a question that's far away. It does not affect us. It happens there. But we were, Paul and I were walking through those places which were there. But coming back to us or, uh, you know, what, what can we do? And I think that becomes an obvious question as a journalist that I would be asking because the groundwater situation is not just something that happens that affects the farmers there, but it's, our, it's, it's that same groundwater that's going into manufacturing Coca-Cola, groundwater that's being used up for the cultivation of avocado in Chile is, is causing droughts, right? So I think all these points are so interlinked. I think we're just buying bottled water now. So it just comes down to this thing of if rivers have changed the face of landscapes across the world and definitely in India, Whose land is it? Whose water is it? You know, and those are, I think, the deeper questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Because dams being created for development, well, whose development is it, is, uh, is it for? Uh, those, are, those are the questions I think we need to be asking ourselves because that again comes down to the question of human rights, uh, for whom, uh, whose rights matter more. Yeah, I think I'll just stop there. Thank you, Priyanka. 
Um, okay, now I'm going to start the audience Q&A. So we have a good bit of time for this, which is great because I see a lot of very specific questions. Um, I'm just going to start at the top. There's a question from Aditya Ear. Um, it's pretty long, so uh, since I'm reading it, I'm going to simplify. Um, Aditya writes, it seems clear that at an institutional level, be it political or judicial, no one seems interested in taking environmental degradation seriously. In that context, what can be done to tackle the immense water crisis facing the country? Um, I'm gonna open that up to any of the panelists who wanna speak. Uh, all right, I'll take that uh, question. And uh, I'll also uh, want to mention what Aditya has mentioned in his larger comment that uh, there's been a severe crackdown on lots of uh, human rights and environmental rights in India uh, recently, including one very recently, uh, which is uh, something that came to surface just today, that uh, the Fridays for Future India group has been targeted by the government uh, uh, and charged under the terrorism law. And I think that's what Aditya is pointing at, that it's so obnoxious and something that really needs to be called out and uh, questioned. Um, and when people see stuff like that, I guess that is when they're losing their uh, confidence on whether the institution, institution really wants to address this problem or not. Uh, and that institutional confidence building is something that uh, has to be done bit by bit. Uh, we've eroded a lot of that uh, in the past few years. So uh, I guess it's only a people's movement that is an answer to the question that Aditya is uh, asking. Uh, along with that rebuilding of institution, uh, which has to uh, um, do this in a measured manner and uh, take into account nuances that affect our environment and water. So yeah, if anybody wants to add. Arati, there's a call here. Um, we had a conversation with an engineer, a water engineer in Bikaner, if you recall, when you were talking about some of the things that Sid is talking about, which is like, what, what are some alternative solutions to the industrial approach to water management in, in India? And could you, could you um, just re recap that anecdote for us? Because remember the, the kind of dismissiveness of, of any sort of alternate solutions other than massive canals or, again, almost terraforming, you know, transforming the surface of the earth. You were countering his kind of engineering hard speak with, with soft solutions like rain harvesting, even in cities. Can you talk to that point? Grassroots solutions? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's something that I think uh, any of us that are working in this space face all the time because you will run up against the engineering mindset, um, which is, uh, is all about solutions and technology which will solve those, solve problems and so on. Uh, but they often um, tend to veer towards one size fits all and, uh, and also a hangover from um, from the British days where, uh, you know, technology was suited to rivers that are in England and Europe and so on. Our rivers are very different. Our land is very different. We need solutions that are local, that, are, that suit the landscape that we are in. In fact, the landscape in, uh, I, would, I would say the landscape in Jaisalmer in the deep Thar Desert is very different from the landscape in Kota, which is in the east of Rajasthan, even though it's in the same state. So, you know, there'll be different solutions for even those places. So even micro landscape solutions. And I think we've lost that. We've, we, we are trying to do these massive tops down, a um, lot of money pump into it. And it's always, you know, um, we always have these sugar daddy, uh, you know, banks, international banks that want to push these solutions as well and so we're always beholden to big money and um and we kind of tend to think of that and i think it's also a little bit of what we have been educated to think uh, our education is not necessarily local and tailored towards understanding our own milieu um and so Yes, so that's exactly what, uh, and I was bristling during that conversation. I think Paul, Paul knew, Paul could sense that too. Um, and uh, we face that all the time because 
in the Thar Desert, for example, you can do a lot with uh, traditional 800, 900 year, year old methods of rainwater harvesting. But these engineers are already sold on the large canals that are pumping um, Himalayan water down to the deep desert. And it, it hasn't worked. I mean, if you go to Jaisalmer district, you'll see how it hasn't worked. And uh, a place which never had never seen a mosquito is now uh, the number one in malaria in the whole Rajasthan state. So things don't work if you try and push things which work somewhere else in a place which it's not suited to. And uh, I think again, you know, so a lot of these things come down to mindfulness and being um, doing what's right for the local place. Uh, but for that, you need um, the willingness. And I think that goes back to Sid's point of, you know, you might know all of this, but are you willing to do it? And that political will, um, unfortunately, in India today is, uh, I mean, it has, has always been um, uh, lacking. Okay, um, next question from Tim Hudson. Uh, what sorts of innovations are being developed to respond to the problems of droughts um, and other water issues? Um, and in particular, are there uh, sustainable large scale solutions? Arti, do you want to answer that? I, I think I just take on, <laughs> I just continue from where I left off just to say that um, again, you know, in India, you have very different um, uh, situations for each place, like, you know, even within, um, even within, say, Karnataka state, which is the state that Bangalore is in, where, we, where, we, where I am right now. Uh, Bangalore is very different from another part of Karnataka, which gets a lot of rain and so on and so forth. And so, um, to, to, so drought, for example, is, uh, is something that can be solved very locally. And uh, in and and we have unfortunately not done what it takes or what it what it can take to solve to reach that uh, that conclusion. And again, uh, one of the people who's actually in in the audience, um, uh, Vishwanath Srikanth, he's uh, he's he's always said, you know, look at what we can do here locally. You know, even just above uh, on the roof, for example, of my house, how how can I solve that problem? So drought is something that. Um, that can very easily be um, be solved by just thinking a little differently. And uh, as my friends in the Thar Desert say that, you know, before a drought of water comes a drought of ideas. And we really, I think, in this at this point in India are uh, grappling with the drought of ideas. We don't seem to be able to uh, muster up the courage to, to think differently and, and do what it takes to do. So again, I, I'm not so sure large scale solutions are even um, even the option because we are uh, you know, so to so many, so many. Uh, so that? Uh, yeah, I think we'll go to the next question. There's like quite a lot. So let's try and cover more because we've almost answered the question here. I think Sid, Paul Sid, wanted to come in. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Sid, actually, an anecdote. I'm, I'm a storyteller, so I think of anecdotes and I've walked with both of you. I remember walking up to Prince, Prem Singh's farm, right? And could you just like, in, in, if you can, condense that amazing genius's mindset into one minute to expand on what Artiji has said um, about right. somebody who's taken a micro approach that is replicable because um, Siddharth and I walked through the Bundokan in, in North Central India and we started seeing these check dams and these water holes that were like, they began to multiply across the surface of the, of the landscape, thousands of them. And here's one individual who's responsible for maybe 10,000 of them in terms of micro harvesting uh, surface water to allow sustainable farming. And I'll, I'll stop there and let Sid tell the story. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a huge story, but I'll try to uh, summarize it into <clears throat> the example that I just showed where the government wants to take water from one river to another river uh, is a large scale solution that's proposed uh, at the current uh, time that project costs over uh, six to seven billion dollars that's the kind of money world so, uh, it's quite clear uh, at least for a lot of us that uh, that's why the push is that side uh, on the contrary at the same place there are people who have done alternative work including Prem Singh uh, that uh, Paul just mentioned uh, in the same space in the same geography what he has done is that he's uh, created a micro climatic 
space within his farm where uh, the water, the basically it's like a water balance uh, between the water that's falling on the earth, the water that's seeping into the ground, the water that's being taken out uh, for drinking and the water that's being taken out for uh, farming. And by just working on this small equation of water on where this water is going, uh, what are the kind of crops that are taking more water than they should, uh, they can be allowed within that space. So creating this local balance uh, in his farm, uh, now he's trained others around them uh, in that uh, district, in that state, who've been able to replicate that model of dividing the farm into three um, uh, three parts, where one third uh, grows food, uh, food grain, one third grows vegetables. Uh, some part of it is for uh, water conservation and some is, uh, um, uh, I think, for agroforestry. But the key, the uh, one could do all of this and still not be successful because uh, what Premji says uh, is, I'll paraphrase him, that you have to stop letting the market take advantage of you. Food is expensive. People are making extreme amounts of money uh, using uh, selling processed food. He says uh, farmers need to make the market come to their doorstep. If they can do that, they can solve their problem of money because it does come to money. So I think this, uh, because they're not running behind the market, which I think, uh, I, if I make this point, will answer a few more questions in the uh, Q&A, is that the market, which is driven by the government's policy, focused only towards, say, wheat and rice procurement, uh, makes farmers grow only that, uh, which is something that is assured from the government that will be bought. And uh, at one point, maybe it made sense when we were suffering famines, uh, we needed more food security. But now that we have achieved that, I think there needs to be a relook. And uh, this relooking at policy that pushes certain kinds of crops to be grown uh, might probably be our silver lining to solving this problem. Um, thanks. Next question from Sumadri. Um, as dams are being built, uh, how are the interests of local communities and local ecosystems taken into account? I think the question should be rephrased with, are they taken into account? <laughs> This one, this is a this is a question that's fraught, and it's actually pretty uh, timely. We are we are talking about uh, a couple of dams actually that are planned in India, which uh, which are pretty controversial, and um, oftentimes uh, dams are not necessarily um, anything that even benefits uh, the local communities uh, as such. Uh, so it's um, it's a different ballgame. It's not about the local communities, and very often uh, there are so many. Uh, instances in India, sad, sad instances. I think there are, I think the total dam displaced number, and I, I might be wrong, but I think it is in the tens of millions uh, of people in India, and they have still not been um, relocated, rehabilitated, uh, you know, adequately, adequately, and so um, that's it's still a mess. I'm sorry, sorry to be all doom and gloom here. So that yeah. over to you. I, I, you I just to wanted say. to add that. All of this that RP mentioned happen when we still have a policy that mandates this conversation with local communities who are losing their land. At this, on this day, uh, the earlier instance that I mentioned of environmental groups getting cracked down upon, they were all cracked down upon because they were sending comments to the government for a new policy that has been proposed. And that new policy basically wants to take away the mandate or the responsibility of the state to consult locals on these exact issues. So for all the injustice that has happened with the existence of these laws, this law is getting further weakened and the requirement of uh, such uh, uh, communication with communities is being reduced. This is going to further expand. So uh, a lot of these questions that we have, I think, and I don't know if we can take all of them, but I think this talks to a lot of the questions regarding policy, what can we do? Um, you need to get your hands dirty. 
you cannot do this sitting at home. Uh, you have to go out on the streets. You have to uh, rage against these policy decisions that take away power from communities. And uh, we need to, and we need to ensure that these don't happen. We cannot let these things happen. We have to get our hands dirty if we want to solve any of these problems. If not, the market is driven by capital today and that will continue to happen. So yeah, I think people's power need people's uh, power and people's uh, ideas and people's priorities, common people's priorities needs to come to the uh, front. And if people are going to step up and speak out, then they need to be informed in the first place. Uh, there is all this talk about, you know, flooding in Assam and various other disasters happening in other parts of the world. And there's not a single story that really looks into the why of it. There is no attempt to constantly shine a lens on this issue. So where is this activism going to come from? I don't even know what the issue is. If I hadn't happened to join this call and listen to Sid and Arthi, I probably would have still been ignorant of this. So how many people are watching and how many of them are going to be active? We need the media to understand that this is an incredibly important issue that, that affects all of us. And we don't see that understanding now. Uh, uh, Prem, just to your point, uh, just last week we were having a discussion about groundwater and drought. And uh, the point was that you, we think about uh, drought only when there is the drought. We don't think about it all throughout the year when the drought's not there. But you know it's going to happen uh, because there are like. Uh, floods. Exactly. I'm just going to add to that. He's just talking about floods. The national media attention is there only as long as there are pictures that can show people in really bad shape. But then it's all forgotten. So, yeah. And uh, yeah. even when you have a drought or a flood, what the focus is is showing some of those images of, of areas that have been covered by water and writing some anodyne copy about how many people have been affected and how many hectares have been uh, inundated. And that's it. There is no tracing it back to first first causes. There is no, unless you understand the cause of the problem, you're not going to even start solving the problem. So we, the reporting that we do is, oh yeah, there was heavy rain and therefore there was flood. No, heavy rain doesn't necessarily mean flood, like Paul pointed out. Uh, there are areas which have the heaviest rain uh, fall in the world. It doesn't mean that you have floods over there. We never go to first principles, to first causes. We never try to understand the root of the problem. Just a couple of, you know, images of, of devastation and we're done. Exactly. I think we, we focus a lot on symptoms, not on actually diagnosing what the problem is. And that's, um, you know, somebody, uh, I think Camille asked a frame of, uh, as a reporter. I think every reporter needs to do that you know, just that due diligence, right? Yes, what you're seeing, you're seeing something, but why? Why is that happening? It's not necessarily what you're led to believe. There are sometimes um, different reasons, and those reasons then point to solutions, actual solutions, which will, which are not band aids. So, yeah. Um, thank you. I'm gonna. Go. Oh, was who's that? Bianca, you want to weigh in? Oh yeah, I, I just want to quickly weigh in and say that uh, like the floods in Assam, that's like a regular event. Uh, and I think there is always a complaint about the national media not paying attention. But even with the local media, I think the reporting ends the moment there is a relief package that's announced that, you know, uh, this, this amount of millions of rupees and this kind of ration kit is going to be given to the affected people. And that's where it stops. So I think we also, as journalists, have stopped asking beyond just, you know, what goes beyond the relief. I just wanted to add that also because, yes, relief is necessary for, you know, just for people to really get above the water. But how do we stay uh, beyond it. You look at the Mishin community in Assam and they have always been living with the water. So they have built their house on stilts. And so they just know that that's the way that it's, it's, it's most effective for them to live. They cannot build concrete houses, skyscrapers. Uh, I think in Assam, nobody is asking questions about the rampant urbanization. 
So uh, it's within the journalists themselves and the communities have to be asking Ryan always just talking about the national media's attention, which is definitely necessary. But then if it's, but if an area is so uh, prone to floods all the time, uh, if, if the problems are local, the solutions also have to be local, right? So I just wanted to quickly say, say that, yeah. I just want to add one single line to this, is that uh, it's also media houses that need to come up to this. It's not just journalists, but media houses that are whole, as a whole that need to come up and take this responsibility. Um, Can I have an observation? Uh, just um, an idea come up since we're all in the business of, of communication on this on this uh, roundtable. Can anybody address the issue of not just media houses, not just journalists, but audiences? The notion that audiences in cities in India are very different from audiences in rural communities. And you all know where I'm headed with this, right? Because my outsider's observation was pretty much I've never seen such a vast divide in the parallel realities of rural and urban India. And that's my outsider's perspective walking through for a year and a half. They inhabit different universes. Anybody want to take that on in terms of how, it, how you, as storytellers, as communicators, um, bridge that chasm? Is it possible? I think the short answer, Paul, is if we call ourselves communicators, then spend time in the areas that we are trying to communicate from. I remember getting kind of blown a little bit when Aarti first said that she was going to do a story on the desert, and then she said it'll take about a year because she wanted to follow the four seasons. And for me, at, for me at that point of my uh, thinking, a year is a book. It's not one narrative for my uh, website. And it's only later that you realize that the deeper you go is when you begin to start understanding uh, the, the, the real issues, the core issues. Um, unfortunately, we live in a world where we are always about, uh, when, when we were doing Peeply, <clears throat> at the uh, Kalyan, Rahul Bhatia and I, it, this was the idea. The idea was deep reporting. And we go to media houses and they're like, how many stories in a month or how many stories in a week? And can you give us a 700 word story with six images? Uh, it was never, what is the story? We went to uh, fundraisers to raise money and the VCs were like, what is the ROI? Show me the hockey stick growth. Uh, how do you go to 1 million unique users and 50 million page views? It, there are some things that you can't measure in terms of ROI. This is one of them. You can't measure a reporter's time in terms of how many stories came back. It is how deep was the story, how well thought through was the story, how much of research went into the story. Some stories deserve that, but we don't seem to be aware of it. And again, I, as far as I can see, it's, it's almost a global problem. It's not just us. I just add one more thing to that in terms of the urban rural divide. It's, um, I, I would probably step once, go one step back, and I think it's more um, a cocoon versus, uh, you know, it, it's it's these cocoons that we have built for ourselves. And I, I, my one advice to anybody who asks me how do how do we do something like this, like storytelling, is buy a pair of walking shoes. And that's all I tell them because I think anybody, whether they live in the city or whether they live, you know, wherever they live in a small town, if they go walking. And if they um, and just you know kind of let let themselves be in a in a landscape, they'll begin to understand far more than if they're in a car uh, which is air conditioned and you know looking at their phone while it's driving through places. And so I think it's I I would love for people to you know come walk with us. Uh, just it, it I I came with so many biases and every single time I step out into the you know, out of the room and onto the road and into the uh, landscape, those biases start, you know, just kind of pom, 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 like little, you know, bu you know, bubbles bursting. And it's it's wonderful because, you know, you start seeing things very differently. And uh, uh, I think that's essential to understand anything, you know, to be able to experience it. 
Also, that's the thing, Paul, that we talked about even last uh, week, that reporting is very transactional. It is based on an event. So yeah, I would send somebody to Assam right now to document the flood, but he needs to document it and get it, uh, get it back to me in two days, not you know, spend, uh, spend time walking that stretch, trying to understand why this water uh, sort of escalates every time there is rain. Uh, so, I mean, again, to bridge the urban-rural divide, we live in uh, urban environments and we are the ones who run media and we are the ones who report. And we never go to the rural places unless there is actually some kind of story that we are supposed to be telling. I mean, that, that is the whole point of, about that out of Eden walk. It's probably the first time in years that I was stepping out of a city and just walking in the middle of nowhere, wondering where, where the next you know, cold drink was going to come from. And that opens your eyes. And, and if I don't experience that, how am I going to communicate that to somebody else? Also within the city, how many of us go walking in our neighborhoods? How many of us step out of our you know, house and not into a car and then to actually walk through the neighborhoods and see there are so many stories. There are, it's, a city is many little things, right? It's not just like one monolith. And so that is itself, I mean, it's just a question of, I think, exposing oneself to, to things. And so it's not like one mindset within a city, even within a city, there are several different milieus and to just get, kind of break those silos and walk through this is wonderful and thank you Paul. I mean it's just uh, been a wonderful experience doing this. Um, so we're we're right about at the time um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna end the recording um, but we're gonna stay live we're gonna stay on so the audience can stay on the panelists can stay on and address more of these questions um, there are too many questions to do out loud, uh, but the, some of the panelists may be able to stay on and answer them um, uh, via text. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, and then also, uh, please, uh, many people are asking about a recording of today's session, so we will have that. It will be on the Inside Nat Geo uh, YouTube page. Um, but just follow Out of Eden Walk on Twitter, follow Out of Eden Walk on Instagram, and we'll share the link later today when it's ready. Um, and please sign up for the next panel. It's Thursday, next Thursday, July 30th at the same time. Um, and we'll be talking about the human impacts of the water crisis in India. Um, thank you and stay on if you, if you have more questions. Thank you everybody.